Lovely. We are live. Let me welcome, welcome everyone to WeHo Reads Shaping Motherhood. We're celebrating Mother's Day uh, a bit early this year with some fabulous writers who are going to um, lead us on a mindful journey. We're considering everything about motherhood tonight, uh, the joys, the hardships, the challenges and graces, and the role they play in shaping ourselves and future generations with an eye toward how this gets included in, um, in writing and literature. I am very, very pleased to introduce Colette Sartor, who will be leading us on this mindful journey. Colette, uh, Colette's linked story, short story collection, Once Removed, won the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction, the New York City Big Book Award for Short Story Collections, and the Juror's Choice Award, and the Short Stories Award from the National Indie Excellence Awards. She is great hands for us to all be in this evening. Colette, thank you, and take it away. I'm so happy to be here with these wonderful women and writers. Please excuse me, my voice is a little hoarse tonight. I did a lot of talking this past weekend. Um, so I thought we would start with everyone introducing themselves. And uh, I thought a nice way to do that would be, um, I'll ask a question and um, you can introduce yourselves and then we can address that question. If you want to introduce it right off the bat, after you, uh, if you want to address it right off the bat, wonderful. Uh, but I think it's a good way to start this. Um, and it's something I think a lot about because motherhood is so central to my writing. Um, how has motherhood affected your practices and identity as a writer? And um, I'm going to kind of, I can't even remember the order of reading in, but I'm going to go to A for Amber first. I had a feeling you were going to be <laughs> first. Okay. <laughs> Um, how has motherhood? Okay, my name is Amber Flame. I'm an interdisciplinary writer and artist. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me, Carla, to be on this wonderful panel. Um, how has motherhood not shaped me, I think would be the question at this point. I don't, I don't know that there is any, any aspect of my life that has not been completely flipped upside down and turned around by becoming a mother. Um, I think the biggest way it has influenced my creative life is um, by giving me a sense of urgency. Um, I don't have any time to waste and it feels that way. It feels in the same way that um, the kid grows up so fast and in a blink of an eye, you're in a completely different era and the old era will never come back again and will never be the same. Um, it feels that way with my creative practice too. So it feels like I'm almost growing my creative self up alongside my child and curating it in the same way. And I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that. That sounded smart. Oh, that's so beautiful. That. <laughs> that's beautiful. Thank you, Carla, who is the organizer of this panel. And we're all so grateful to her for gathering us. Uh, Carla, I'll go to you next. Hmm. I'm going to say what she said. <laughs> <laughs> what she says. But um, so I'm Carla Samoth. Um, I am a writer and a poet. I'm currently um, one of two poet laureates for the city of Altadena. Um, and I have a memoir and essays one day on the gold line um, and a chat book um, that came out um, not too well. Well, now it's been like two years. Time flies during this life. Um, how has it impacted me? I, everything about... I would say writing and motherhood are two of my anchors and two of the things, and they're, they're just so intertwined. It's hard to see where one let off. It sounds kind of codependent, but the other <laughs> um, picked up. Um, I, I wanted to say a little bit about my memoir because it, it's so much, because it is really a, a memoir about motherhood. Um, I was actually on a lifeboat in the middle of the Mediterranean when I realized that if I were to die, my biggest regret would be never having had a child. Um, and the memoir, my memoir is about my difficult journey to having a son and the myths that I believed about how easy it would be to create a family as, as that was a safe sanctuary. I thought that my son having a queer mom, him being black and Jewish, 
being part of a blended family or even single parent would make life richer. Um, but it was so much more, the reality was so much harder. Um, the memoir is about really how I, how we navigated life's challenges like in, around um, race, identity, police violence, um, and my teenage son's struggle with addiction. Um, but it's also about, we, we definitely, we write about that there's a lot of difficult, there's a lot of difficulties with motherhood, but there's also so much joy and vulnerability and intensity really from the moment that you first imagine, you first desire having a child, you're vulnerable to the worst kind of loss. Um, and, and I think that's so much part of the motherhood experience and part of what um, I always end up circling back to writing about motherhood identity some of the we, we revolve around some of the same issues so I'm going to leave it at that to start out with okay go down the alphabet <laughs> yeah, it's exactly it's exactly what I'm doing it's it's I just I'm also obsessing about that whole fear of loss that you that you talked about because that that's what I write about <laughs> and and it's so tied to motherhood so yeah uh Louis Betts please uh, hi, I'm Louie Resto. Um, I am a poet. I have three books of poetry. Um, two, the first two are from Theatricia Press, uh, Ascension and Unfinished Portrait. And my latest collection, Living on Islands Not Found on Maps, uh, is courtesy of Flower Song Press. And I am the mother of three children, three teenagers now, actually. So I have a 14, soon to be 17-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old son. And um, who I call my revolutionaries. That is the name I called my children. Uh, and the reason I call them that is because since they were little, they took over my life. And I was like, well, like a revolutionary, they're going to take over your life. So they're my little revolutionaries. And each of them actually has a title based upon their personality as they were children. My daughter, because she is basically the strategist and in charge, she's the minister of strategy and operations. She's basically the brain of the operations. Um, she's quiet. She's actually a behind the scenes person. So versus her brothers are more outgoing. Uh, and so my oldest being the oldest, he is the minister of diplomacy. He is always, he's in, that's just who he, to this day, that's who he is. He's always the diplomat. He's always the peacemaker. Uh, he's always trying to find the middle ground between conversations, which is amazing and beautiful. He's a better person than I am sometimes. And my youngest, who broke everything that he ever got his hands on since he could walk or crawl, um, he was dubbed uh, the minister of defense because he was the muscle. He was going to be the muscle guy. Like if you needed something to be taken care of or broken, he was going to be the muscle. Uh, so which is, again, very true to this day. Um, so those are my revolutionaries uh, in thinking that they're going to be prescribed something. So I really want them by, by hanging out with me, going to poetry readings, going to museums, hanging out with artists who are constantly thinking and reinventing themselves and their art. I just always want them to, to see the world in, in a different lens than I, I, I was growing up. And I always want, and that's, again, we always, as parents, we always want to do better. We want them, we want to leave them better than we got them. And so for me, I, I literally, my writing is for them just in the sense that I want them to just be able to know that if, if they are interested in the arts, if they wanna live in that world, if they wanna even like dip their toes into it, that it's a possibility and it's not something that they, they can't sustain themselves. And, and, if, and, in, and not just the artistic world, but anything, right? Like if they wanna do anything, it's like, okay, anything is possible and I can change my mind somewhere in between. And that's also really important for them to know that they're never cemented into a box. They can also step out of that and then go somewhere else. So I think that's how motherhood has definitely shaped my writing and my identity, um, because that's how I try to, I try to incorporate that into my writing as well. I love that. And you and I need to talk because I had a very similar <laughs> feelings about life and children and getting married and yeah. Thank you, Gerda. I would love for you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes, I'm Gerda Govini Tuarte. I'm the author of five books of poetry. I started writing when I was uh, 78 years old. And 
I have lived in the Virgin Islands and lived in New York City, Pasadena, now I'm in Hamul in San Diego County. And the reason I started writing poetry is after the death of my second daughter. It was the only thing that allowed me to breathe, to go from day to day. And I continue writing because I can't help it. I continue writing because it gives me a place and space to be that's mine. And so I am the woman <clears throat> I am today because of my daughters. I've learned so much from them. And even though they're not here physically, they never leave me. And so usually you don't hear many stories about women who have lost their children. But for me, I write because I trust the words, the words trust me, and I'm a stronger person for this. And even with the death and the dying, there's joy, there's laughter. And so I am blessed in many, many ways. And the two blessings of my life have been my daughters, uh, Lisa and Dory. And sometimes I talk to them. Sometimes they talk to me. And there's a certain kind of strength and a willingness to try new things that is part and parcel of my being their mother. I impacted them, but they continue to impact me in a way that is a gift every single day. And I write about them because they show up. I have certain memories. So I don't say I'm gonna write a poem about Lisa Dory, whatever. It just shows up and I trust what shows up. So I'm able to then find the words and put it on the page. So it's been a, an interesting journey. And the poetry writing really helped me. And I also joined a group at the time of women who had lost their children. And that was my second lifeline because we didn't have to talk a lot. Sometimes we just sat quietly. So I was gifted with my daughters. I'm gifted with five books I've published. And I continue to write until I can't because I love it. And it gives me a certain sense of peace. And the silence has become my friend because that's where all the wonders show up. Thank you. You know, I have to remember that because you're right. The silence is where the wonder shows up. And I can be afraid of the silence, I have to say. And, you know, I've got a son who's 18 and, you know, supposed that moving more and more out of my life. And I think that's part of the reason I'm dreading that silence because now I'm going, in a way, I'm feeling like, well, am I going back to the place before I had children where, it's just me in my head. But from, from what you've just said, I'm reminded that, no, he's always with me. Mm -hmm. He's always with me. And for me, I think I'm writing, even before I had children or admitted I even wanted to get, you know, have a partner or have children or anything, I started writing. But I was writing about motherhood from the opposite end. Mm -hmm. I was writing about it as a daughter trying to work out the complexities of my relationship with my mother and and project that into other worlds and other people to see if I could better understand it. But once I had my son, then I was projecting all of my fears and all of my, you know, my, my fear of losing him, my fear of being a terrible mother, my fear of screwing him up. And I forget to project the joy sometimes that I get out of him because they're really remarkable people, our children. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, it's something that I, I love this. I, hearing each of you speak reminds me that motherhood is all encompassing and can be overwhelming, but it's also, there's such beauty and grace in it mm -hmm. because we have these people who are so very much themselves and they've allowed us to come along for the ride with them. You know, they're really, yeah. So this is a wonderful reminder 
Um, I know we're going to do um, um, a, a little introduction uh, thing in just a few minutes. We only have about two minutes, right, Cody? Um, so I'm wondering if maybe we want to start that early and then we'll at, do questions later after we all read since we're right at 718. That sounds good. That sounds okay. good. This Wonderful. has been such a powerful introduction. I'm I'm I've got thoughts spinning in my head around the the differences between memory, between presence, embodiment, and how all of our feelings just get wrapped up in um in so many different ways that we interact with our, you know, our relationships. Um so thank you all for sharing that. Um it's my uh, responsibility, honor, slash duty right now to um, thank everyone for being here. This is the um, this is the last uh, WeHo reads in our winter spring season. So this is the fifth event. Um, there will be more later this year, but we're kind of reaching a turning point, and that's uh, that feels really great. And I'm glad you could all be here um, for this. Um, we're here because the city of West Hollywood um, is committed to the arts and makes funding available for panels and presentations and workshops like this one. Um, so we're very grateful and to them and want to thank them um, today. We also want to thank um, the other sponsors of this series, which include the UCLA Extension Writers Program, which I know many writers um, here and around uh, the area, you know, have have learned from, but also have taught at. And so um, we thank them. We thank also poets and writers for their mini grant program, which provides funding to um, individuals who take part in events like this. Our media partners are BookSoup, bookshop.org and the LA Review of Books. And we're grateful to them for spreading the word and helping us reach the audience. I am pleased right now to introduce who is coming on at exactly the right time, as usual, Mike Che from the City of West Hollywood's Arts Division. Mike, thank you for having us, and um, it's yours now. Uh, well, thank you, Cody. Um, and as Cody mentioned, this is a series that is uh, presented by the City of West Hollywood. Um, I have the honor of um, presenting our land acknowledgement. Uh, we do want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that the land that is currently known as the City of West Hollywood is the occupied, unceded, seized territory of the Gabrieleno, Tongva, and Keech peoples. We honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging as they continue their stewardship of these lands. This acknowledgement demonstrates our responsibility and commitment to truth, healing, and reconciliation, and to elevating the stories, culture, and community of the original inhabitants of the lands now known as the city of West Hollywood. Um, I know that people are tuning in from all over. So I do encourage you to look up the people who are the original caretakers of your own lands um, at native-land.ca. I know, I know Amber's coming in from Italy and I'm jealous about the food. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I'm, please uh, take some time to honor those um, that are the original caretakers of your land. Um, and as Cody also mentioned, this could not happen without the support of our city council who funds this every year. Um, and allows us to bring all these wonderful, talented authors, poets, and mothers for this one. So thank you for, to all the mothers and happy Mother's Day. Um, I'd like to invite our council members to say a little welcome to our um, to everybody on uh, here. And I see that uh, um, council member Byers is here. So if you'd like to um, unmute and come along, you could say some welcome words. Thank you. Hi, yeah, I'm really glad to be joining you all. I am um, also not on West Hollywood or Gabrielino Tongva, Gabrielino Quiche land right now. I'm in Palm Desert um, for a SCAG conference, but wanted to load, um, log on just for a second and say how much I appreciate all of you being here as much as we as a city love to support the arts. If there were not artists and people who loved and appreciated the arts there to enjoy it, and our work would um, just be us sitting here talking to each other. And so we're really glad to have a really rich conversation with you all tonight and really appreciate you coming out. And thank you, Michael Che, for being such a champion and so um, great at leading these programs. We really appreciate you and Cody and all the work you do. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member Byers. And um, I know we did have a couple others that were going to join, but I don't think I don't see them here. Perhaps if they do join, maybe they can say something at the end of the event. But um, I will now pass it over because you don't want to listen to us. You want to listen to these wonderful <laughs> writers, poets, mothers. And so we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, and as I'm sitting here staring at this incredible agenda, because that's what I keep doing when I look over here to keep my place in where we are in this, um, that Cody has put together, I can't thank him enough for being the brilliant, organized human being that he is. I have never been part of an evening that has been so flawlessly put together. <laughs> so Cody, thank you so much. Um, we're now each going to read um, for just about eight minutes, and I we are going to start with Amber. Ah, yes, um, I am a little bit more prepared for that. You all did such a wonderful job inter, um, introducing yourself and your work. So I'm going to back up for just a moment and say that, yes, I'm a poet, a writer, among other things, and um, what I'm going to be reading today, some of it is coming from uh, my first collection of work, which is called Ordinary Cruelty. It was out in 2017 by Right Bloody Press. And um, I have a new book coming out. Actually, it's a little bit less than two weeks from today. On May 16th, it drops. It's called Apocrypha, and it's from Red Hidden, Pre Red Hidden Press. Um, and I am going to be skipping that one because it's a love story, and it's not about my child really at all, except, you know, in what he's taught me about love. Uh, to read some also some new work from my newest manuscript that I'm developing, which is about the things that haunt us. And I think it's so interesting. Um, Gerda, you brought this up too, like this idea that they're always, this sort of presence is always with us. And Colette, you're saying that you approached it from trying to untangle the the threads of being, of your relationship as a daughter to your mother. I also very much related to, I feel like the first, my first collection was, um, Ordinary Cruelty was about losing my mother, but also having a mother body and like what it does to the mother body to mother, what it does to the mother body to lose a mother. Um, and so um, I'm going to read a couple pieces. I have permission from my child, Virgil Taylor, to read some older pieces in which I refer to him as my daughter um, and he is my son. So uh, he said, but these poems are important, mom, you can put them out there. And I said, thank you. So an octopus escapes the fishing net. Advice for my daughter as cephalopod. In this life, where you must be both predator and delicacy, rend for yourself the tenderest bits. Enter a world, daughter, where you may drink brine and not be pickled. Lose remorse in the hunt for that which feeds you. Be sure there are eight passions for each arm's embrace in case your dreams are injured or cut short. By all means, keep yourself whole, even as you adapt with grace. Honey love, my sinuous structure, pure musculature and give, infinite flex and reshaping. Do not be confined to any that would contain you. Be relentless manipulation. Hang on, love, or disappear in the confusion of your melanin clouding the display. How they love to watch you squirm and ooze. Be not object entertainment. Remember how to pry open exits. Remember camouflage. Learn both lurk and listen. Eyes open to color of danger, of safety. Do not forget that tucked up in the unfurling of your pretty petticoat of a body, you are thought and plot beak and brain, predator and delicacy, feed. Um, I'm going to go quick because I want to read all of these and I have four for you. Uh, speaking of confronting death, this one's called No Pomegranate, um, inspired by Demeter. Lest you forget, I have already confronted death marched to the door of his very chamber and demanded my child. Walking away from the encounter, babe in my arms is sure proof 
What it takes to become a god is no sneaky escape unscathed. It was a sharp knife, my organs lifted from me and piled on my chest, and creation stitched together with my own flesh and sinew and blood and marrow, plucked from the vine and able to breathe and hear a thousand million years later what I birthed maintains its own gravitational pull and me still living too beneficent despite the scar and seeping womb to write the good book how bang and then life this is a newer piece and i'm still ricking it out i think lessons blood has taught me one betrayal of the body the dress a yellow bright as sunshine and flowered, my favorite early on Sunday morning, scrubbed clean for church service, and the delight of a bare back under God and before the Lord, a pleasure I knew better than to brag about, and the dry heat and sun made of me a glowing and glistening wild thing, sweat curls, skinned knees, carefree grass stains. And the desert, each time, split the delicate membrane of my nose, superfluous bleeding until my dress bibbed gore. The dress, a rusty swirl, demanded its blood debt, demanded cold water and elbow grease, payment for my raucous vanity. Two, now everything will be different. When I wake in a pool of my own making, I will be sure I see my own death's face but my silence is who I'll learn to greet by name, shame. Three, it doesn't pour out like the movies, except when it does. Split skin can look like a massacre or an accident. It all depends how thin it's stretched. Four, birth is an animal instinct even when it kills me. The child is the point. Thickness of a tear repairing, ripped open again each month. It's when I smell myself in baby folds, becoming a hole that grew in me. How fresh skin was the barely shelled extension of me. How each day the child grew more alien, no longer my thing, fully an own thing. I have left, I have left the corded mark of entry made. Reminds me how I split my own self, spilled willingly. Five, what it's made of. The article oversimplified the study, but scares me anyway. A woman's body holds the DNA of every man she's fucked. And I pray for mercy. It was just one man. And I asked for grace. It was a long time ago. And I remember the only times I felt embarrassed, squat on the toilet, hoping to slide out of me completely what I intentionally took in, shame. Dick made me stupid, girl. Like, curse of Eve each month be blessing and relief, right? Like, better late than never, since I ain't never better, safer than sorry. And now that man is blood relation, is what God or accident hath joined together, and all the good in the world will not asunder. Now that man is over a decade of my story with no end in sight. Now that man is scrawled all over my child's face. Now he claim his court of blood in me. Too. And I'll end with this one. Feast. Her father takes thousands of pictures of her, videos, his third child, my only one. We watch her as only devoted parents can. I am teaching her to identify herself now, here, fully loved and in love with herself, because I know in a girl body, this will not last long. Sometimes I feel willing to do anything. The most forbidden thing to hold her here frozen in this moment before she learns the not enough the too much the feast tender chicken plump and juicy firm in their mouths their mouths already watering for the devourer I ride the bus with her. She loves riding the bus. She enters and everyone everyone zeroes in and smiles at her my little daughter my tiny son the world revolves around her easy hello her willingness to know anyone and welcome them in I watch them watch her, monitoring signs of grin gone sour grimace, gone lip lick, gone tender flesh renderer, tendons popping slick with marrow, the crackling snap of crisp skin laid out on fancy platter, on paper plates bent with load and soaking grease. She will not fall apart to their fork. I say this to myself, convince myself. It is not enough. I know this. 
If she makes it untouched to 13, she will be a miracle. Fate too long tempted every one in three girls. She is her father's third child and the one who has not made it yet. And still she will have already learned all the secret ways to hate herself, to no longer look at her reflection for the only confirmation needed of her beauty. She will have already learned the way of laying herself out, inevitable for the feasting. I know the dinner invitation of sexy women, all juicy thigh bone and succulent breast. On the bus, I watch her grow into platters of meat ready for the taking. Watch them, watch her, and smile. I, all serrated teeth bared, know it is not for her to be less delectable, but for them to control the rumblings of their own hunger. And if this is a lesson they cannot accept, I will ensure she inherits serrated teeth too, and ready claws, and an appetite for sustaining. Yes. Thank you so much. That was incredible. Yeah. Just yeah. wonderful. Okay. Um, I am reading next, and I'm going to read from my Link Short Story collection. And I, I have to say, I do this every time I read um, in a group. I have one thing picked out, and as people are talking, I think, oh, maybe I should read that other thing. But for once, I'm going to stick with the one I started. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, a little, little warning. There's a little bit of gore in it. Um, it is not perhaps as... Um, Mother's Day oriented as it might be, but this story really sprang from the fears that I can't push away in the middle of the night when I think about the things that could happen in life to me, to my child. And, and actually, this also came from an incident that happened in my neighborhood that then kept me up for nights and nights and nights and nights. So I'm going to just read from the beginning of the story because it's long. Uh, and it's called Extra Precautions. Someone is killing cats in Claire's neighborhood. A cop shows up Sunday morning to examine the nearly decapitated tabby on Claire's front lawn. Its eyes are milky, its head thrown back. There's a triangle of blood-soaked grass between its neck and body. Probably a machete, the cop tells her. He crouches by the dead cat and squints up at Claire who shivers in shorts and a tank top that just covers her gently mounted belly. A house key is tucked in her running shoe. She was about to go on her daily walk when she found the cat. Looking at it makes her want to gag. You should be more careful, ma'am, especially in your condition. Carry a cell phone for emergencies, the cop says. He's got misshapen ears, a lipless mouth. She's Pretty sure he's the guy who testified against one of her assault cases last year. A homeless kid who took a swing when the cop woke him up in an alley. He seemed like a blowhard then, too. With his baton, he prods the cat's head, tearing the grisly piece of, piece of connect, connective tissue. Third decap around here. Seems like the modus operandi prod, prod. Although... It's a skin cat near Fairfax, prod, and one chopped up on Miracle Mile, got spread out all fancy, like the killer was being arty. The grizzle rips completely, freeing the little head. It rocks blindly toward Claire. The cop wipes his baton on the grass. The bully. Fairfax and Miracle Mile aren't even that close to here. Poor pregnant girl can't stand a little blood, he's probably thinking. She nods in feigned indifference. He was trying to scare me, she tells Duff later that morning. He's reading the art section in their tiny breakfast nook. She stands at the kitchen counter, mashing bananas for banana bread. He grins. Fat chance. His newly bleached buzz cut glows in the sunlight. Dead cats, burglaries, occasional shootings, all are normal in Los Angeles, even in this West Side neighborhood, which is quieter where they, where, than where they used to live in Hollywood. Just last week, a radio shack a few blocks away got held up by some crackhead. But she and Duff can live with that. They're city people, they reminded each other after the cop bagged the cat carcass. 
and Duff hosed down the lawn until there was no trace of blood. They've seen everything. Still, she imagines the patch of damp grass glistening in the sun. Most of her clients are guilty of what they're accused of. It's never bothered her before. All right, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit to uh, a scene where she and another lawyer are driving out to meet a new client at a juvenile hall. Monday morning, she and her co-counsel, Judith, drive out to East Lake Juvenile Hall. They've been assigned a new client, a 14-year-old who killed his grandparents. The ADA filed against the boy in adult court, which requires an immediate objection. Claire usually welcomes the investigating and strategizing involved in a new case. Today, she dreads the details. It's a relief when Judith drives for a while, whistling resolute, resolutely before sharing what she knows. He called the police after she, he did it, Judith finishes, as she steers the car toward the freeway exit. Did he give them a typed confession too? Just his knapsack with his grandparents' hands and feet. Their heads were in the oven. Claire can't help gagging. She grips the dashboard. Judith glances over. <laughs> Warning sickness? Or have I finally succeeded in grossing you out? I'm okay. Claire unwraps some crumbled banana bread from her bag and chokes down a bite. Her skin still feels clammy, but her stomach stops heaving. <sighs> this case sounds impossible. We'll figure out an angle, Judith says as she breaks for the exit ramp. Savvy was sick constantly her first few months, said it should be called all day sickness instead of morning sickness or a strike me dead sickness. Judith's smile makes her plain freckled face luminous. Her wife, Savvy, gave birth to a baby boy two weeks ago, which has made Judith even more upbeat than usual. She's always whistled when she's anxious to raise her spirits, and now she's added countless nursery rhymes to her repertoire. Claire tries to emulate her positive attitude, especially about work. The system can't function unless people like her and Judith defend it. They have to forget about guilt and innocence and focus on protecting their clients. From outside, East Lake Hall could be a rec center or a school. The front is a wall of gleaming windows with palm trees and flower beds flanking the entrance. Inside, there's no mistaking it's a prison. The metal detector by the door has guards at either end. Posted nearby is a large sign listing visitor rules. No blue or gray or khaki clothing, no weapons, no drugs, no alcohol, no gifts, no backpacks, purses, briefcases, hip pouches, etc., etc. As always during visiting hours, there's a long line of people waiting to be patted down. Claire usually, usually uses this time to jot questions, consider options. Today, she can't look away from the visiting children with their unbridled energy, the way they play hide and seek behind the grown-up's legs. They could be anywhere. Once Judith and Claire get through the metal detector, they sign in at the reception desk manned by a guard behind bulletproof glass. Then they're led through several locked doors to the visitation center, where they wait in a tiny soundproof side room that smells strongly of disinfectant and more faintly of mildew. They take the chairs closest to the door and window overlooking the visitation center, leaving the chair by the cinder block walls for their client. Claire has braced herself for his youth, but she still isn't prepared for the hulking boy who shuffles in, his hands and feet shackled. His name is Zeke. He's well over six feet tall, but his face has splotch is splotchy with picked over acne, and his features are softly rounded. Floppy brown bangs fall into his eyes. His pupils are so dilated, he looks like a startled animal. Fear or drugs, maybe both. Judith said he's on a mood stabilizer, which could bolster an insanity defense. He's probably textbook abused, too. There's a story to be woven here. They can defend this kid. A guard removes the shackles before he leaves, shutting the door behind him. The boy is within arm's length. 
He staggers when he tries to sit. An urge to flee surges through her. She reaches out anyway, but Judith grabs him first. Your meds could be too high, Judith says to him. Our shrink will adjust him after she interviews you. And we'll work on transferring you to a psych ward. Her tone is casual, as if they're discussing what he had for lunch. She looks tiny next to him, breakable. He barely glances up, grunts as he steadies himself on the spindly wooden table. His hands are chubby, the nails bitten below the quick, the hands of a child. But what he's done, what those hands have done. Claire hasn't seen the crime scene photos yet, but she knows enough from three years in the public defender's juvenile defense division to envision the spatter popping the grandparents' cheek, the ragged meat beneath their chin. We'll get you through this, right, Claire? She looks up to find Judith frowning at her. Attention. She tries, but for the rest of the meeting, she barely registers the boy's slow, stumbling responses to Judith's questions. Instead, she keeps imagining holding a knife Slicing through flesh and fur. All right. Um, after that cheery reading, uh, our next reading reader is going to be Lou Yvette. All right. That was a really good reading, though. Thank you, Colette. That was beautiful. All right. So, as I mentioned, the kids are called My Revolutionaries. So I wrote this poem called Someone's Mom because I always look in the mirror and I always go at least a couple of times a week going like, I am someone's mom. Like, I don't even know how that happened, but here I am. And so, cause in my mind, I'm still in college. Like, I don't care. I don't know about y'all, but I still feel like it's 1997 in my head. Uh, so um, this one's called Someone's Mom for My Revolutionaries. In my mind, Don LaFontaine narrates the beginning of every morning. And Don LaFontaine, really quickly, if you don't know, he was actually your movie guy. He was the one who was hired to do all the voiceovers for movies for like decades. So like if you watched a movie in the 80s, 90s and 2000s and you heard this voiceover going in a world of tomorrow, that was usually that was going to be like 90 percent of the time it was Don LaFontaine. And then when he passed away, that's when I found out who he was. And that's why he's mentioned in this poem. In my mind, Dalla Fontaine narrates the beginning of every morning. In a world full of dentist appointments, field trips, asses to wipe, lunches to pack, homework to sign, one woman's name echoes through Rocky Mountain laundry piles of angry bird underoos and Hello Kitty jeans. One woman answers to the call of mommy. A technicolor of communist colored dresses, Yankee caps, Converse sneakers, and one faded I hate people t-shirt, proudly worn at PTA functions and children's museums, occupy the closet where nothing pastel or animal print is welcomed. Morning dance breaks to the Beastie Boys are mandatory like syrup on blueberry pancakes with a bacon smile and whipped cream eyes. A mid-afternoon glass from my favorite bottle of wine in a sippy cup with the words mommy juice don't touch. Sound like adore the Explorer episode asking for things in two different languages. Say darn when I stub my toe but scream motherfucker when another parent cut me off at the drop-off lane. I pretend to change my name to Queen Sheba of the desert, plugging my ears from three voices in monsoon of questions. How I wish to respond. No, I don't know why ants are that small and who cares or ants. Forget them. Watch me take advantage of their size with this chancla. Darwinism at its best. On Columbus Day, I teach them about hubris, genocide, and respect for the property of others. On New Year's Eve, I write each of them a letter of the obstacles they conquered, new games they mastered, colors they discovered, the lines they stayed in, the boxes they thought out of, new lessons they learned in and out of the classroom, like opening the door for anyone, or the power of listening, especially when an elder speaks. With each passing year in the surreal lands of Marquez and Paz, I challenge patterns etched in the knots of our family tree, carve new ones in the extended branches with smiles instead of tears, hugs instead of raised hands and voices, break traditions of alcoholism and apathy with Lego hammers. 
take them to bookstores, show them mommy's name on a spine so they know guidance counselors can be wrong and how anything is possible. So that's for my revolutionaries. Um, and like I said, I have my oldest, Antonio, who is 18. He's gonna graduate. Um, he's graduating in three weeks, woohoo. Um, and so super proud of him. But when he was about 13 or so, or 14, we were having these conversations and it's a very, very tiny poem. Everything in this poem, I guess it's considered a found poem because everything here actually happened. It's called Breakfast Conversation with My Oldest Son. Another man shot today, mom. I don't think I ever want a license. Driving isn't the problem, mijo. Driving isn't the problem. Um, thank you. Uh, so I have a daughter. She's amazing. She's my only daughter. Um, and um, this was maybe this poem is probably a decade old now at this point. Today, another woman painted my daughter's nails. Today, another woman painted my daughter's nails, metallic pink reflecting off seven-year-old hands, once gripped my index finger as I fed her 1 a.m. meals, naturally tanned hands disappearing into my palm when I kissed them goodnight, hold onto mine as she climbs stairs. Today, another woman decorated my daughter's nails with the first color to adorn her 17-inch body, Fingertips held by another who never contributed to the creation of my daughter's perfect 10 fingers, 10 toes, never wiped off tears and kissed skinned elbows when my daughter thought she was the Latina evil Knievel, defiantly zooming down hills on her scooter screaming, I can do it, mama. Today, another woman painted my daughter's nails. But tomorrow I will paint her future with a rainbow of my learned lessons about strength that rises after a cry the necessity to sing off key at least once a day and trusting manicurists who offer more than just pink. <laughs> uh, this is a longer-ish poem, again, stemmed from a, a Q and A that I did with Chi Wan, uh, from my press mate from Theatricia Press. And it was just really startling. We did a Q and A and a young man in the audience was like when, he heard our bios and he knew that I was a mother. He said, well, where are the poems about you being a mom? Where are your motherhood poems? And this young man, I was just really stunned and my, I'm really blessed. Chiwan came in and said, well, why don't you ask her what my poems are? Like, why is she getting those poems? She could write whatever fucking poem she wants. And at the time I wasn't writing about being a mom. I, I to me, that was a very private, private, that was a very private matter. And I wasn't ready to write about my kids yet. So eventually I wrote this response poem probably about eight or so years ago. A poem for the man who asked me, where are your motherhood poems? He didn't have the predictable inquiries. Do I write in Spanish more than English? Do I italicize the Spanish words or include a translation glossary at the back of the book? With an accusatory tone like a private investigator out to solve the case of the missing poems, as if I purposely erased my kids' existence and memories in some poetic version of witness protection. Should I write more about the irony of never wanting to be a mother in the first place? While other girls talked about having babies and a husband after college, I spoke about wanting 80-hour work weeks, burying myself in depositions. Should I write more about the abortion I had at 22, find the appropriate simile for the feel of a vacuum in my cervix, how I made my future husband witness and hold my hand while I sobbed on the exam table, legs wide open, reminding me how I got there in the first place. I think about the women who cannot have children, the price tag of IVF, the bureaucracy of adoption, the women who still have to prove to their tias, mothers, sisters, other women that their worth isn't in the uterus. Because my body's sole purpose is to be a vessel of life and not sexual satisfaction, never contemplating the perfect metaphor for the best orgasm I ever had. I should be careful of slut shaming myself in my sonnets when I say fucking versus making love, pussy versus vagina, dick versus manhood. So where are the motherhood poems in question? They are embedded here in the pores and cells of this poem that cannot wait to breathe. And I'm, I think I have one more poem. I'm, I think I could do one more poem. Yes. Um, 
So this was uh, <laughs> right after Obama got elected. So 2008, um, I just had my youngest son. I just had given birth to, uh, yeah, my youngest is 14 now. And I'm sitting there weeping as the election results were coming in, like just weeping with Anderson Cooper and everybody else, right? And my four-year-old, like in a, again now, who's five foot 10, five foot 11, comes in and he goes, why are you crying? And so this is dedicated to that moment. It's called Christmas Lies. Yes, I was an Obama mama, decorated my car with kitschy bumper stickers, bought an Obama is my homeboy t-shirt, believed in hope, change, hope for change, change in hope, heard he got gained by public enemy when I saw his numbers, cold called vo voters and reminded them that no, he isn't a Muslim, yes, he's an American, and yes, he believes in God. Stared at the TV screen with glassy eyes when he greeted a Chicago crowd, a third dimensional revised version of the American dream. My six-year-old son asked me, why did this man make me cry? Who was he? And when I replied, he's our president, my son instantly said he wanted to be that someday, wear bright ties with dark suits, wave flags and smile broadly at crowds. Yes, you can, Antonio, I said in the best imitation of our new leader. This time I didn't feel like I was mommy lying like I do around Christmas time and pretend to leave Santa voicemail messages about Antonio's latest good deeds and timeouts. This time I knew his statement could be a future truth along with his quest to be an astronaut, paleontologist, or a ninja. But the euphoria of election day and the ubiquitous discussion of post-racial America dissipated like confetti when the economy didn't bounce back after inauguration day. A Puerto Rican woman was chastised for making a wisecrack and Americans' health reduced to a business plan. Christian churches celebrated the paradox of holy book burning. American states demanded fellow Americans prove their citizenship. All of it making it feel like Christmas. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, now we are going to move on to Gerda, our final reader. Wait, I haven't read yet. <laughs> My goodness, I skipped right ahead. Carla, we're moving on to Carla. I apologize. That's my uh, very tired brain not working. Carla. It's okay. I'm a middle child. I'm used to it. <laughs> you and me both, honey. <laughs> wow. Okay. Wonderful, Carla. Thank you. Uh, I'm really, it's wonderful following this, these talented women, women, mamas, just I'm so moving. Um, I'm here to write, to read to you about the imperfect mother. Um, I just, spoiler alert on my memoir, I did get off the burning boat and lived and um, after many miscarriages had my son. Um, and this, I'm going to read from an excerpt from an essay, it's a memoir and essays, um, called Hashtag Cray Cray Mom. And at this point, my son has been in and out of several treatment programs for drugs. And um, I've come to pick him up at his inpatient treatment center. Rafael had been in the inpatient treatment center for 30 days, and the insurance company said his time was up even though neither Raphael nor I felt he was ready. I was in this volcanic state then, barely over pneumonia, and feeling the PTSD of running in and out of ERs, hearing that my son might die soon. We were sitting in an office with Raphael's assigned therapist, who was preparing to discharge him. She had just informed me that Raphael wanted to go home with his father for the evening. I threw myself on the ground, begging him to come home with me. I watched Raphael's face fall in disbelief at his mother's wild, almost possessed convulsions, resembling a bride we once witnessed in a Baptist church getting the spirit. What do you want from me? I asked. I, I could kill myself. Will that make it better? Raphael ran out of the office. At the treatment center, kids lay about the living room area watching reality rehab shows. Raphael received daily therapy, ate healthy meals, went to an empowerment group, and had therapy sessions with his dad for the first time. Occasionally, I also met with Raphael and his therapist. 
These sessions didn't go well. Raphael was furious with me. I was sad and afraid that I'd caused his despair, angry that he held me responsible for the times he felt his dad had abandoned him, not being willing to set a regular schedule and refusing to be with him when Raphael didn't act right. That afternoon at the inpatient treatment center, the day he was to have gone home with me, Raphael ran from me, his molten mom. I was crazy with fear, fear of losing him, fear that he would always blame me for his addiction, and fear that perhaps it was true that it was my fault. No matter how many times I was told, you didn't cause it, you can't control it, you can't cure it. Not knowing where Raphael had fled to, I sobbed uncontrollably, ran out to the parking lot, and frantically called the people at the new intensive outpatient treatment program Raphael was about to start. They had given me specific instructions to take him home with me, not send him with his father. I believed if I didn't follow their instructions exactly, I might cause him to relapse. I didn't know what the formula was to battle his addiction, and I was desperate for direction. Though the plan Raphael made with the inpatient staff was to spend the night with his father, I still hoped that he would come home with me. But they told me they had called his father, and I was no longer an option for that night. I thought I'd hit bottom then, running in and out of the building, sobbing while the staff, teens, and other patients stared at me. The horrified look on Raphael's face before he bolted said that I had finally gone too far. But I continued erupting. I ran around the treatment center and found my son huddled outside in the protective loom of the center's staff. I had to push my way in, asking permission to talk to him. Who were those people who felt they had to protect him from his own mom, I wondered. Raphael stood away from me, seeking refuge from his crazy mother. Suddenly, I wanted them to take me in. I wanted what Raphael had experienced for 30 days. I was a desperate child mom, even though the staff could have been my children age-wise. Raphael, I addressed him. No response. He looked wary, scared, as one staff member held his arm around him and asked, You okay, son? Raphael, please come home with me. I didn't mean it, I said as calmly as I could, but he heard the shaking edge and knew it was a temporary calm. Children are trained to hear the possibility of eruptions. I know, having lived through the minefields of my own family. Raphael, please, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I've just been so worried, so tired, I pleaded. Underneath my panicked eruption was grief, fear, loss. I didn't feel that I could bear it if I lost my son especially without ever recovering our close relationship, without fixing things. No, 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 he shook his head. I can't go with you, I can't. And then, just like that, the words tumbled out of my mouth as if I was watching them in slow motion, in a voice bubble, unable to take them back. What do you want from me? I'll do anything you want. You want drugs? I'll get you your drugs of choice. The staff stared at me. This might have actually been a first in their adolescent treatment center. They led me out. Another counselor held Raphael as he stumbled away. One young staff member, far closer in age to Raphael than to me, put both arms around me. Mom, come here. Calm down. Let me give you a hug, he said, and held me the way I used to hold my son when he was younger and couldn't contain himself. Moms, it's okay. Calm down. Everything is okay. You need to take care of yourself. Later that evening, I spoke with the parent coordinator from the program. She was both an alcoholic and a parent of an addict. Both she and her daughter, who was only a year or so older than Raphael, had solid years of recovery behind them. She put her daughter on the phone. Ah, the threatening to kill yourself, she said. My mom did that with me. The daughter explained, we can't stand seeing you, our moms, so early in, the reco in our recovery. You only remind us of all the fucked up things we did. Just looking at you makes us feel guilty. We want to use and we can't. A week later, I continued to wonder, who is this mom who fell apart the way I did at my son's treatment center? I attended a parent meeting and heard a mom say, the doctor asked me what I might do if my daughter didn't stop using. And I said, I know exactly what I'd do. I would drive my car right off a cliff. I had longed to create a safe, strong sanctuary for my family as an adult. Even my stepdaughter had admonished me over the years. Carla, you know you can't make everyone happy. I certainly couldn't make her mother, the second person I married, happy.
I remember myself as the fighter, the one who protected my two sisters from skinheads and hate Ashbury in the 1980s. Do they remember my fierce protection in those teen and young adult years? Or do they remember only my bottomless despair as an adult when I've tried to make untenable situations okay? What was your bottom, Raphael asked me later when he was 18. That time, offering to buy you your drugs of choice at an inpatient substance abuse center. Raphael looked at me and nodded knowingly. That was my bottom, but I had cried so many times before, before it, convinced that I had lost my son forever, convinced that I could never make up for all the suffering, the loss of stepsister and home, the war zone with his stepmother, and the rage and absence of his father, my own craziness in response, desperation to control the uncontrollable. A mother wants to fix things to take her baby in her arms and rock and nurse him until all is okay. Even when he's 18, this is what I thought when he fell asleep, head on my lap, and yet another waiting room. I'll stop there, thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And I'm looking to see how to unpin you. <laughs> there we go. Um, thank you so much. And now for our last reader, Gerda. Uh, Gerda, I don't, I can't, I can, I think you're muted. There you are. Sorry about that. It's okay. Okay, four short poems. Mothers who carry their own water. When there is no well, land is parched, mouth dusty, skin cracked, bloody fingers plant thornless roses. Mothers who carry their own water are viewed with discomfort. Curtains of words fall. I don't know what to say. Time heals all. Whispers trail behind like tales, a reminder of what could happen to them. Mothers who carry their own water live through in, under, around the death of their children. How? They never ask why. Lean on winds of change, find warmth in cold places. Push through survival to thrive. Move beyond black and white. Traverse shades of gray. Refuse to stay stuck in grave. Dig deep for well inside. Identity. What do you call a woman who is married? Wife. What do you call a woman whose husband died? Widow. What do you call a woman who was married? divorced? What do you call a woman who never married, single? What do you call a woman whose child dies before she does? This is about one of my daughters. Um, Pepsi was her nickname, she loved Pepsi. 16 years old, hair twisted on pink rollers, teddy bear shared pillow, child of the 60s. Effervescent sweet, make no mistake, will of steel, promise enforcer. Miss popularity, friend magnet, sister's confident, caretaker. Loves to write, diary queen, spelling bee champion, first place ribbon, proud mom, sudden illness, death, slow motion madness, spirit on knees, drowning in dread, words choke, morning rises, she sits at breakfast table, Voice clear, haunting, 
why haven't you written about me? Grab pencil, napkin, words erupt, fingers fly, read aloud. Her smile hugs, better now, grief subsides. This is my youngest daughter. Um, and this is when I knew that she would not uh, overcome her illness. And she was in the hospital at the time. I see you. I see you. Face swollen. IV snakes along bed. Flashes of consciousness. Body stirs at touch. Long curly lashes. Peel upward slowly. Eyes look past now. Staying or leaving? Trusting in her decision. I may have one more to just let me see here. Lakeside, beneath plump gray clouds, she sits in the shade of her memories. Slivers of sunlight shadow pierce underwater sky. That's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much and thank all of you. Um, you're such tremendous. You're so tremendously talented, and you're as both readers and writers. And I'm awed by the range. I feel like we've covered the whole range of motherhood. You know, in a, in such a variety of ways, um, and it kind of brings me to one of the questions that I was going to ask in the beginning, but I might as well ask now. Um, I guess some, some writers write those stories that they need to hear. I'm not sure that that's why I write about motherhood, but I'm always curious, I'm, I'm curious to hear, do we write the stories as, as mothers, as, as daughters of mothers? Do we write the stories that we need to hear about motherhood? Why, 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 are, or why are we writing the stories that we're writing about motherhood? Do we need, are these the ones that we want to hear that we're not hearing anywhere else? And I'll leave that open to anybody. I'd like to answer that. Um, one of the reasons I write about motherhood is because the words kept growing inside and I needed to get them out. I needed to breathe. I needed to write. So, Whenever I write about motherhood, about my daughters, it's something inside mm -hmm. begins to rise. And I just go with it because I can't swallow it. Yeah. I can't put it down. I have to let it be. So I basically let the words help me find the way out. Because if I didn't write what I've written, I would be in some mental institution. I would not be able to cope. So it's a release. So the joy of my writing comes from being able to put on paper what my whole body is saying, let us out, let us out, write it down. So for me, it's, it helps so much in so many ways. Yeah, it's an absolute necessity. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carla, go ahead. Well, when I was trying to have a baby and later when my son was things that some of the things that we were dealing with, I kept looking around and I kept writing in little spurts the way we do when we're, especially when you're single working mom, you know, whenever I could fit it in. Um, but I kept looking around for things to read as things would go on in our life that, and families that looked like our family. And I couldn't quite find that, um, you know, Jewish, black, queer, multiracial, um, and all the different circumstances that we were facing. Um, and I also 
like it was really important to me to capture the joy and the humor. And a lot of times people talk about how difficult it can be to be a single mom, but I also wanted to capture that there's a beautiful intensity, especially when there's one, only one kid and one mom, and one mom, you know, between the two of them, you know. Um, so it, it's kind of, I, I kind of wrote, you know, I, I gathered bits and pieces of different books, different authors, and I kind of wrote the book that I would have liked to have read at the time. Um, and um you're right because yeah there really is nothing out there like your book i will say yeah every every writer wants to think that but (laughs) but but i wasn't seeing a lot of families like our you know circumstances all together you know um i was you know and um during one of the periods where we were going to our hmos outpatient treatment program i also was really struck by that the circumstances that, you know, it, they were all, we, we all had kids of color and the social workers were mostly all, were all white and we're giving instructions like, you know, when this happens, call the police, you know, and for those of us who really want to do our best to keep our kids out of the criminal justice system and are more afraid of that, you know, it was, it was a real disconnect. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, throughout the the years, that was something that I that I looked for was were stories that I could relate to and that looked like our family, not like Norman Rockwell or Leave It to Beaver or something. Mm. Thank you. I was gonna say, I, I'm I'm hoping that well, most of the thinking world realizes that those families have never existed except in picture books. But I know that there are people well, out there. Well, there's it's just not a complete story yeah exactly they might exist exactly. in the as a picture but what's well as a nice know, the veneer, 3d version right? the 3d <laughs> version of them is much different um exactly i would say i don't i i really struggle with this i know that whole like you write the book that you need in the world i am compelled mm-hmm. i don't choose what i write i don't choose what comes to me i think i'm as i'm trying to write more prose and essays um, I have more choice and agency, but as a poet, I'm, I didn't, I don't set out to write about motherhood. I just am a mom. And so that's going to come out in my work in the same way. I don't set out to write um, explicitly like w- black poems or queer poems. I just, they are black and queer because I am black and queer. And so um, I, I agree, Carla. I didn't see myself in a lot in in my family that I grew up in or the family that I was building in a lot of stories. Um, And so I, I, but that wasn't why I had to write it. (laughs) I had to write it because I had to, Um, like Greta said, it had to come out. It had to come out of me. Um, and, And also I feel chosen. Like if it doesn't come out of me, I might go insane, but the the message is going to come from somebody like it's going to come out somewhere else. And yeah. maybe the blessing passed over me. Um, but it feels very much like a calling that I can't a voice I can't ignore. And it 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 might be about my kid or it might be about my mom. <laughs> it might be anywhere in between um, or not at all. And I don't know. So I don't dictate it. How about you, Livia? Um, I think that I. I agree with you. Like, I don't set out to write mom poems, right? I don't set out to write like Puerto, like Puerto Rican poems or being bilingual. Like it just happens, right? That's just who we are. Those are, those are all parts of our identities. Right. And so, but I know that now that the kids are getting older and I think what I, I realized that this last book, I wrote a lot about family and I wrote about being a single, being a single child in in a family that has a lot of addictions and my mom is an alcoholic and then and and really wrestling with being a parent I remember and that's that was like I actually talked about that in one of the poems like when I found out I was having a daughter I I flipped out like I really had a very like having my first child and it was a boy I was for some reason like I was good with that I was like well we don't have boys in the family there's no reference right like I can't fuck this up because I have no reference right and then when I was pregnant for the second time and I knew it was a, a, a girl, I distinctly remember kind of having a moment of like, oh shit, like she's going to inherit all this 
shit that all the women in La Familia has. Like there's these ancestors, the elders, and and there is this kind of like theme, shall we say? I don't want to say curse, right? But I'm gonna say there's a theme that runs in the mujeres in my family. And there's this dread that came up. I was like, well, what if I become my mother with this daughter? What if all the things that I hated growing up, then I just, without even consciously realizing, I go ahead and perpetuate this to my daughter, right? And then the cycle continues. And with my sons, I was like, that cycle is going to end because they're, you know, they're sons, they're, they're different, right? And so I think with the poetry, what that has helped me do over the last few years since they've been more family centric is to really reconcile with those feelings. And it's helped me kind of come to terms with that I am my own mother, that I am different than the women in my family. And in some ways, let's just be real, there's some similarities between me and my mom and my grandmother and my tia. Um, but I would like to believe that I'm, I'm, make, I'm moving the needle forward in our family. We're different, right? We're, we're talking about our feelings. We are not hiding our feelings. We're having, you know, my kids are allowed to share their feelings. They're allowed to say, I need a break from you right now. And there's no repercussion, right? Like no one's raising a hand to anybody, right? And I do know that we're breaking a cycle. And so I think the poetry for me is helping me become a better mother and therefore a better human. And also like, again, now that the kids are getting older, my relationship with them is changing. I think you said that Colette too. It's like your relationship changes. Now you have adult children, things are shifting, but still they're, your, they're still your children. And I wanna set a good example for them as to what does a healthy relationship look like, right? And that's so critical. Um, so yeah, I think the poetry has been helping me just be a better, a better example to them. And and that's what. And I'm what doing. does and what does a healthy exit from a not healthy relationship look like? Because you're right. probably going to have to practice that a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> for right. me, like everybody is. You're reminding <laughs> me of that that Spider Man meme. Have yeah. you seen that? Where Spider Man's holding back a, a bus, mm -hmm. and there's a kid crossing a crosswalk with his headphones on, just like on his phone like this, <laughs> and Spider Man's holding back the bus, and it says the bus is intergenerational trauma. Spider Man <laughs> is me, and the kid is my kid. Like we're just desperately trying to hold back that bus coming at our kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that that trauma. I think it's a really good point. Like generational trauma is real, and oh, we, it's so real. And we carry yeah. that with us in our bones. I firmly believe I do in my bones, it's in my DNA. And then I know a piece of that passed on to the children, the boys and, and my girl. And it's just like, okay, what do we do with that? Let's just talk about that. Let's just be real. Again, I didn't grow up in a, in a, in a space where we could have safe spaces and safe conversations. Now let's just, let's, let's not repeat that. Let's do something different, right? Um, cause it's not going to be pretty. I think that's what also motherhood has taught me that I, I also have a lot of imposter syndrome. I don't know if y'all get imposter syndrome or like, I don't know how many people here have been like, oh yeah, I'm fucking up. Like, oh, I just messed that up. Uh oh, I wish that's I could all I write about. Yeah, I, once, I, once, I once had this exercise. Uh, I was in a workshop with Ada Lumon years ago and she gave this exercise. She said, think of something that you're really ashamed of that you haven't told anyone. Of course it had to do with parent, you know, and, um, now forgive yourself now write it and mm -hmm. that was so powerful um <laughs> but i was just going to say something about poetry i think amber mentioned that poetry that it calls to you it call you it, mm -hmm. you're called to write something versus like i'm going to write about this yeah and i feel like there's a different part of the brain with poetry and pro because for sure it was different it's different for me with poetry than it is with um like memoir um mm -hmm where there's a lot of reflection in memoir and there's, you know, it's just a whole different part of the brain or something, you know, because yeah. poetry, yeah, you, I just feel like that's the thing that you wake up at three in the morning and you just have to write that poem, right? Well, that's you right. had to get up at three in the morning anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes yeah. it's to make it say, as I have to write a poem, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right, because I don't write poetry, I write prose. And you're right, there's more reflection, there's more shaping and and agony <laughs> well there's always agony in writing for me at least but the, yeah it's, I think it's a different process but I do think we write from this from the same instincts because I don't like all of you have said I don't necessarily write 
the stories that I need to hear. I just write the stories that I can't help but tell because that, you know, I, I yeah, mm-hmm. because I come Beautifully from said. The, it's Louisette, I, I, again, I so identify with what you're saying. I come from this long line of very angry women mm-hmm. who are brilliant and thwarted. Mm-hmm. And so they express so much of that in their mothering as good as mothers as they could be at times. There was this anger, especially at the girls because we were going to go forward and maybe have, they wanted us to have a little bit more than they had, but they could also see it was still going to be hard. And there was, so there was this whole anger thing that I was determined not to repeat. And at first I thought I was not going to repeat it because I wasn't going to have children Mm -hmm. because I was terrified that I was going to pass that on. Mm -hmm. And then when I did decide I wanted to have a child, because I finally met a person who didn't look at me like I was insane and I was just being myself, you know, he's just like, that's who you are. Um, I was thrilled that I was having a son because I was terrified of having a daughter and passing on that trauma. And yet, even though I have a son, you know, I still, especially when he was little and I was resentful and I was exhausted and I'm sorry, I did breastfeed and at times it was wonderful, but God, it just Mostly felt awful. like it was. Yes. It just, it just <laughs> went on forever. I had to send my son to nursing at Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. And just, I, there were times where I would find myself, he wouldn't go to sleep and I'd be standing in the middle of his dark room, screaming like a maniac, just go to bed. <laughs> and I had to write those stories mm. because I had such guilt. So I thought, I don't right. want to be that person. And I think by writing about it, I found a way to be the kind of person who would make those mistakes, but could also go to her child, unlike other people in my family, could go to her child and say, what I did was wrong, and I'm sorry. Give them a whole self as a mom. Yeah. Yeah. A whole person. Yeah. It's a way of processing. I think it's more like write the story that we need to tell. You know, it's a way. I love that. it's, I mean, I don't know about you, but sometimes like writing is a way for me to really understand something and come out the other end a little bit. Yes, yeah. very much so. Very, very much so. I need to write through it. And it's, it's, I wish I were one of those writers when I sat down to write a story or a novel who just had the blueprint in her head <laughs> and just mm-hmm. knew what it was going to be. <laughs> And that'd be great. Uh, <laughs> tell me how does that? Where, where do they get that at? <laughs> I, I, I hear people. I want that. I've heard it talked about in corners. Yeah. Um, whispered about, but you know, I have this. It's usually an emotion. It's usually a fear. It's usually guilt. It's usually I did this terrible thing, and then I find a character to embody that. I find a character who vibes with that and who understands and who mm-hmm. says. Oh, that's me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, and then and then I kind of feel my way through it. Mm-hmm. You know, but it's it's yeah, it's so much of it comes from that emotion of mm-hmm. I need to be better at this, or or I need to forgive myself if I can't, mm-hmm. and then find a way to do better by my kid. You know, another thing I thought about is. I feel like when I'm writing, I'm holding up a mirror of myself, my life, because there are some, I don't write every day, but whenever a poem says, I'm here, do something, I do it. And and to be able to hold up a mirror and see your beauty and see your blemishes and know you fucked up and know you're not an angel. All those emotions and feelings, they end up on the page somehow. And that's important because you imagine you have to swallow all of that. Mm -hmm. We all be in an insane asylum because we're able to let, we're able to let ourselves go, let the words out. And, And by doing that, we're able to breathe easier and then get ready for the next round or whatever it's gonna be. So for me, it's, 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 it's a joy. And sometimes you write about stuff that's not joyful, but that's yeah. also part of it. You mm-hmm. can't say, I'm going to only write about the good stuff. 
boring, don't want to hear it. <laughs> I want to know what keeps you going. What are the things you care about? Uh, what helps you to feel better? And even when there's crap happening, you can write about it. And then when you're done, you're done. You can move on to something else. So I think when you're a writer, it's very difficult to just swallow everything. You know, just keep swallowing. And, and, and we, we find ways to get it out, to share our words, to have words lean on us and say, you need to trust me more. Mm. I trust you, but you need to trust me more. So just let it out. And you don't have any, well, you don't have any idea until you're finished. You say, you know, because sometimes words kick your butt. You know, it's just, you can't get it right, but you get to a place where you know, I'm holding on because it's coming. I'm going to win this particular race. And yeah. uh, it's an exciting, it's an exciting thing to be a writer. For me, poetry is it because that's where my heart is. And it's helped me so much in my life, you know, with so many different things in so many different situations. And, um, and I believe we're all blessed because we're writers. I also think that that's like, like you were saying, it, it keeps us sane, but it also, this is the part of motherhood that is, that is mine, that is selfish, that mm -hmm. is not about, I'm not, I'm not writing about motherhood or about my experiences to leave a legacy for my kid. I'm writing <laughs> about it for my own sanity. Um, <laughs> it is, it is the experience yeah. of it that I'm curating mm -hmm for me and for people maybe who can relate to that side of it. And I get to the child is completely present while also being absent um, because it's not about their reaction or their response. It's for me. It's for my reaction and my response. And in fact, I always assume that my child isn't going to read it. That's correct. <laughs> Unless because... I make him. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, um, hold on. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Cody has a question. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing that. Um, uh, but I'm not. I you know I I Cody, have a question. Ahead, We're getting up to the end. I've loved yeah. how the how the discussion went, and I'm I don't want to ruin the vibe. Um, oh, that's a great question, though. <laughs> I'm wondering, so, you know, because we're talking about like, in many cases, literal motherhood, like the experiences you've gone through, but you also are in situations or scenarios in relationship to other people where you're kind of called on to play question. that role. And I'm wondering, you know, what is that? What does that feel like? Or how do you navigate that? Sometimes it's wonderful. Sometimes, you know, it, it, I think it happens a lot with students, mm -hmm. um, but I've also had it happen with friends. And sometimes it can be a really lovely thing because as that person, at least from a literary person, when I'm thinking about the literary motherhood, as that person grows as a writer, that that mother relationship is so much easier to let go of and, and say with pride, go with God, this person's incredible. Um, Amber, it's really late in Italy for you. What do you got to yeah. say about that? Yeah, it's Amber. like, absolutely not. I, I, I absolutely <laughs> am not your mother. I, I have birthed one child. That is my child. I am not your mom. I will not be mammied. I know absolutely not. It is not my role to be a mother to my, my students or anybody else. And I think that is like, because so many of us were, were poorly mothered in mm. a lot of ways. There's a lot of uh, seeking that out. But mm. but I refuse to suckle, frankly, mm. no. Um, and 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 it, I've absolutely been put into that position multiple yes. times. And so, um, uh, yes, no, I will. Well, not. you keep the boundary. You keep the boundary. It, it has to because yeah, yeah, we can have yeah. a professional yeah. relationship. Yeah. We can have a literary relationship. Yeah. But what yeah. we cannot have is a mother daughter mother child no, relationship. Exactly. I have one it's child. Always, <laughs> it's always the. It's always about the work. And you have and to keep that tries, distance. Yes. Yeah. And when someone tries to go beyond that, yeah. they'll use you, you up. Stop. They will use you up because yeah. you because they need therapy, because they need healing, because they need to confront things with their own mother. Like the, you cannot replace the conversations that they need to have with somebody else. Mm. So it's not going to benefit either, and it will only lead to a situation in which you do have to like sever ties, um, yeah. and it usually hurts somebody a yeah, lot yeah. more than 
you know, they're not usually willing to let go of that once you establish it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I love that question. Cause yes, I think mothers get put in that position all the time. If you teach. That, yeah. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. Or there's an assumption made, right. That because right. you're a mom that all of a sudden you have to be like super compassionate and you, of course, you're going to be sympathetic. Of course, you're going to be right. the empathetic one in the group. And I'm like, right. no, I got Actually, no empathy. I'm the bitch. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yeah. like sometimes no. I'm like, you're, I'm like you're, I, your assumptions are pretty grand. Okay. Yeah. I have yeah. patience for three people. And, <laughs> and I birthed and, them. And even, <laughs> right, and I birthed them. And even then, even then, my patience is not even that high. Runs low. Well, yeah. Right. I, was gonna oh, say, I don't have I mean, that much patience really. for the one I birthed. <laughs> right. Thank you. Like, I was like, I don't do that. I was like, you, you know, mm-hmm. other people's children. I mean, I'm a teacher to, to young kids and um, it's really easy to be seen as a mom. And I don't, you know, and I, and I like being nurturing. I think there's a difference between being yeah. a mom. I think there's a nurturing. separation between those. I agree. Yeah. Those I agree. Two different things, Nur- being a nurturer or being nurturing, right? To young people or to young writers and then being seen or treated like a mother. Those are two different things in my opinion. Very different yeah. things. Yeah. I agree. I don't mind I being do the, I love doing the nurturing. Right. I love doing the nurturing as, of writers. Yes. No, but I'm not your mom. The mentoring and the nurturing is great, but yeah. Yeah. Well, it's necessary. I mean, I feel like it's our, even if I weren't teaching, I feel as if it's my, like, just as a, just giving it back to the community, I I feel like to mentor is a necessity. You know, I, Mm -hmm. I had such amazing mentors in my life in all different roles, including in writing. And I feel like I have an obligation to give that back. And I think we all function on that level. That's why we're here. Mm. But parenting will teach you about boundaries. And, you know, yes. like, I, what did you say? Promise enforcer, Gerda? I love that line. <laughs> the promise enforcer. <laughs> There's one person in my life who can enforce a promise, who will get a promise yep. in the first place. And I think mm-hmm. that it's really a boundary thing because we because so many people are desperately seeking mom they Mm, really are looking to heal that and and this is where you take your students from journaling into like true creative writing right Mm -hmm. where you go oh that's stuff that needs to stay on the page for you and your therapist maybe and maybe your Mm -hmm. mom um and here's where we evolve it and and like you have to that you can't be in the mother world yeah we can't be in the mother role and be evolving them into art as well yeah yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that whole thing, the difference between journaling and writing. I So I always push back a little bit about when, when people hear that you write memoir, like, oh, that must be therapeutic. I'm like, no, actually, nope, so you need be. therapy after you did this. <laughs> You're digging up a right. lot of past there and yeah. bring it out into the light. And sometimes it grows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When on yeah. Earth. The boneyard. The boneyard gets yeah. unearthed. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. We're we're out of time. Thank you so much for this conversation. I felt like this could go, have gone on for hours and hopefully someday in person it will again. Um, I look forward to seeing you all. Thank you so much.